Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to Sabbath School with the Chesapeake, Hampton Roads, and Western Branch Seventh-day Adventist Churches, where this morning we will be studying the lesson, lesson, Seeing People Through the Eyes of Jesus. But before we get started, we will do as we normally do. We'll start off with praise and testimonies, and I believe we have a praise report from Pastor Stoyan. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much again for watching us and also watching this uh, Bible study, uh, the Sabbath lesson. Uh, I want to thank all of you for praying for my family. I know that um, the majority of you are praying for my, my family. And I want to thank God because this week, yesterday, we've been, uh, I had a few hours, like two hours, if I'm not wrong, was three hours in the afternoon. I said, let me go to the beach with my kids. And when I was putting the, the umbrella and everything, fixing, my son disappeared from my eyes. And all of a sudden, I look on the, on the, on the sea and he was not there. After a few seconds, good seconds, I was very concerned. He's coming out from the water. He was almost dying. He was drawing. Um, and uh, I, I went fast and took him and, and take him out from the water. And I see how God has sent his angels to protect us every single time. Mm. I praise God. Last night we were talking about it. We were talking about it with him. And he told me, Father, I, I, I cry out to you, but you, you did, I could not talk to you because the water was coming in my mouth and I oh. thought I would be dying. He was, he was dizzy. He was a mess. But um, um, I was very concerned. And in seconds, I just turned around to put the things and he disappeared completely from the, from the eyes. And I see how God is protecting us every single day. In other words, we are not dying. We are immortals until God finishes his plans with us. And I'm so happy that God has protected my family. I know that God has protected also your family because we are right now well, uh, the majority of us. And this is, it is a miracle to be well in this world, to yeah. be normal, it's a miracle. Amen. Mm. I'm so glad Reuben is okay. Yes. yes. That well, kid's well, an accident waiting to happen. Every single week we have broken hands, broken. <laughs> <laughs> almost drowned. Okay. And almost drowned. <laughs> But I, I see the prayers that, that, um, that God, God, yes. our God is answering our prayers. So thank you so much for your prayers. We pray for you every day. Yes, and I need also your, your prayers right now also. Mm -hmm. All right, do we have any other praise reports or testimonies? And if not, we will move to prayer requests because as we can see, prayer works. Yes. So we want to continue to pray for Pastor and his family. And I believe there's other prayer requests out there that we should um, petition God for so that we don't know what will happen in those situations, but it's our job as his people to bring those requests to him. So do we have any other prayer requests? I would like, yeah. Go oh, ahead. Uh, I just want to bring up uh, Lorraine Jenkins again, uh, my friend's mother who is um, in a bad way in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I think Mihai had one as well. Yeah, I found out last night that uh, an acquaintance of, of ours, um, she was given two months to live. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we've been, you know, we've been praying for, for her for a while. Um, and I mean, we don't really know what else to do other than just keep, continue to pray for her. And, you know, it's in really God's hands. So I like to, you know, make sure that, you know, we, we remember her as we, as we pray. Amen. What's her name, Mihai? Um, Alcora. Her, it's a really. Alcora. Strange... Oh yes, we prayed for her. Okay. Yeah, yeah I found out that uh, she um, she's not doing well. She's okay. back in the hospital, so. Mm. And she she gave us permission to to ask a prayer. Good. Uh, using her name, so um, thank okay. you so much, Mihai, for for your um, your prayer uh, for your mentioning also for Sandy. It's a pray. It is a praise to God because uh, the doctor said that she has no virus at all of coronavirus, oh, and I think so. yesterday or today she received the news. Uh, so we are praising God for that. Also, pray for Chris. Uh, Chris is recovering well, and for those people who did pass through the surgery, which I'm not going to share the names, but um, we we have them and we know them in our family. So let's lift up those pray people also in prayer. And for our nation, for our nation, for this yes. nation, and for the government, and we see what's going on in the world, how the spike of the coronavirus is, is going, and, and uh, 
let, let's pray for our churches also to be open. One of the churches, it's already closed. One of the three churches that I'm pastoring is closed because of this coronavirus case. Uh, but it's so sensitive right now. Everything is shut down because of that. So let's keep prayer because um, God, God is working miracles in our lives. So we need to stay together and to praise God for these situations. Amen. All right, and if we don't have any other prayer requests, we will um, ask me. Oh. I have one. Heather has okay, there you go. Heather? Yes. Um, I'd like to pray for God to continue to bless the sanctity of marriages. We have a few um, wedding anniversaries this month. Mm -hmm. um, one special prayer for Hannah and Marlon, for Crystal and, and her husband, Thanks, for Mary Lou and her husband. Thank you. And um, we started testing coronavirus at my location at work. Mm -hmm. So I want to pray for the protection for everyone there and for the security of my job. Amen. 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 Thank you. Yes, thank you. And Samuel, did you have one as well? No. Oh, okay. I thought she was speaking at the same time as Heather, so I just no, wanted to make no. sure we don't ever anyone. All right, so now we will ask Mihai to um, pray for our prayer request and start us off with opening prayer. Yeah, let's bow our heads. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, to, uh, to thank you for an opportunity to get together and study your word. And Lord, as you know, there are many things that we're thankful for. There are many things that... Uh, uh, we need your guidance and your help, and we need your healing hand. Uh, we need your blessing, Lord, and we ask that uh, uh, be with us as um, as we go through this through this lesson. And Lord, there are individuals that are sick. There are individuals that need protection. There, we we need you, Lord, and we we don't know what to do. We don't know where to turn to other than to ask for your for your help and your guidance. We know that you're with us and as we pray to all this, we have, we have trust and we have faith in you that you will listen to our prayer. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you very much for that opening prayer. And now we will dive right into our lesson for this week, which is seeing people through the eyes of Jesus. And as we know that uh, Jesus, when he was walked this earth, when he saw people, he didn't see them for what they were. He saw them for what they could be through salvation. So we will kind of dig into that a little bit and see how can we be like Jesus in that aspect. So let's start with Sunday's lesson, the second touch, and we will read Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. So I can grab that for me. It's Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. I'm there. All right, go for it. Okay. Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. Okay, so when we look at this, this miracle, Jesus healed the blind man in two stages. He touched him the first time, asked him could he see, and he was like, well, kind of, but not really clearly. And then he did it again, and the second time he could see clearly. Why do you think Jesus healed the blind man in two different steps or two different stages? I've wondered about that quite a bit, truthfully. I've read it over and over again. And I, I kind of wonder if, if it isn't because sometimes it just is a process with us learning about Jesus, learning who he is and trusting him just a little bit more and a little bit more. I don't know. I, it's all I can think of. 
I, well, I don't I don't think there's any deficiency in the power of Christ. So I think no. there must have been something with uh, the blind man in terms of his faith. Jesus oftentimes when he would talk to the disciples, he said, ye of little faith. And maybe this is just a manifestation of what ye little faith looks like sometimes in our lives where, you know, the Lord is working on our heart, but because our faith is not, um, we're not, we're not sufficient, we're not sufficiently exercising the faith he's given us. We may see things a little bit better, but not as clear as the Lord wants us to. And so then, then the Lord has to essentially, he has to continue to work with us. Like Mary Lou said, which I think is correct to make, make our vision clearer than, uh, than, it, than it is initially. Yeah, I, I agree with, with them. Um, when, when I read it, I was confused to myself, but I, I thought of it a lot. And I um, think that the first healing was based upon his friend's faith because his mm. friends brought him and begged. So the first feeling was upon, based upon the friend's faith. And then um, when the man saw what Jesus could do, his faith helped him to go the full, the full length. Yeah. Oh, I like that idea. Yeah, yeah. The interesting thing about this is if you if you look at a different translation of the Bible, there it gives you a little bit of more detail as far as what's happening, which is like the NIV or the King um, Other versions say that you know Jesus asked him to to focus on something, you know, and I think it has a lot to do with. You know, clarity that he was able to get and you know and I guess in a parallel thing we can say that you know we also need to focus our sight you know on Jesus and we'll be able to truly see you know what he, what he wants us to see in, in many ways actually clear our vision if you, if you want to put it that way. And so what lessons should we learn from Jesus here when witnessing to someone who may not really understand what we're saying the first time around? Patience. 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 Yeah. 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 I think, and I think we have to, it should make us realize that as the Lord is working with us, he's working with other people. I think oftentimes um, I'll say specifically for me, I've made the mistake that you assume if somebody's heard something that they've taken it in. And it's not the truth. You know, the reality is that things can be clear to us from a biblical point of view, but for whatever reason, it may not be clear to somebody else. And it just takes time for those seeds to germinate. And I think we, we don't want to be impatient and uh, rush what the Lord is doing. And, amen. Anyone else want to weigh in on that before we move on? Um, I want to I want to say also regarding the pastor and the question you have if I, if I put in the beginning is Ellen G. White also comments on the fact that the natural elements also Jesus is using them. In other words, a third party something uh, not to rely only on miracles but also to rely on the natural things that we have mm. and uh, I think it's very very good because Jesus all the time he uses um, natural elements uh, to heal and in this case especially in this case using the using the, the earth and all of these elements which uh, Ellen G. White points out to the fact that Jesus let all of those elements uh, for our behalf that Jesus is healing us through the, through the nature, through the natural remedies. Mm -hmm. And the second point that I want to make is regarding the uh, collaboration, if I can say that, sharing the gospel or being partaker of the gospel of Jesus, as, as Samuel said and many other of you said, their friends, everybody was involved in that. So Jesus wanted to affirm their belief and they wanted to affirm their, their uh, trust in him and to be a deeper example. And there are many other things to share in this picture. But for me personally, I see how Jesus is using natural elements um, in our lives also in that time to highlight a very important fact that Jesus can use also the nature, can use also the doctors to heal us. But the most important is to see Jesus straight in the eyes and to see all of these events that happens or doctors that are healing us to see Jesus in everything that we experience today. Mm. Amen. And so now that we've seen the second touch, let's look at Monday's lesson, which is a lesson in acceptance, because Jesus also not only healed, but he accepted people for who they were. Um, we'll read John chapter four, verses three through 34. And this may be a story that many of us are familiar with. It says John 
chapter four, verses thir three through 34. Who would like, like to read that for us this morning? I'll read it. Okay, thank you, Heather. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, <clears throat> How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me? which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that said to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou the living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, spring him up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that sayest thou truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worship in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me that So there's some problem, a technical problem. Aw, mm -hmm. it reads so beautifully. Okay, can somebody else read it? Uh, starting at verse 21. Mm -hmm. Now Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, that the hour is coming when you will neither <clears throat> or this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in the spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When He comes, He, he will tell us all things, Jesus said. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. And at this point, <clears throat> his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why do you talk with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the man, come, see a man who told me all things that I, have did, I, I ever did. Could it be the Christ? Now, then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciple urged him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, <clears throat> I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said, Jesus uh, said to them, My food is 
to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Welcome back, Heather. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So this, this story of Jesus with the Samaritan woman is very timely for today in America. Mm. Jesus was not only, he was very intentional about going through Samaria at mm. the very beginning. And then he chose to engage with this woman at the well who was a Samaritan woman. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the history of that. What is the history and relationship between the Jews and Samaritans that makes this action so remarkable? Well, the little that I know, the, the Samaritans claim Jacob as their father. And I've always kind of puzzled about that because they should have been considered Jews, but weren't they resettled by the Assyrian king pastor? Yeah. Um, these were people that were brought to live and, and to live in Canaan. Correct. So I don't understand why they weren't considered Jews if they were directly descended from Jacob. That doesn't make sense to me. There, there was a, a mixture, there was a mingling. Um, what was the custom of the time was that individuals, the rich people, for instance, they were taken to the kingdom and there are some other people they were placing in, in the land. So they were having a mix, mixture of, of nations. And practically, according to some scholars, they said that it's from Mesopotamia. And, but we don't know exactly, we don't know exactly where are those people coming from. But we do know for a fact that Israel, the 10 tribes of Israel, were not accurate Israelites. They did have something, but they were not. So it, it was, why did they have um, to choose to have another worship or to have another a temple? place to worship? Yes, it, it was because uh, the Temple of Jerusalem was very famous in that time. It was one of the most beautiful temples on that time. It was the pride of the nation, and they wanted to be like, and some of the Jewish also, they, they feel like they wanted to be part of that almost. So it was, it was a mingle paganism <clears throat> mm. and many other things inside. Um, but the desire to worship God existed yeah. in, their, in their blood. And they, they believed that they were descended from Joseph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what was the, the climate like between the Jews and the Samaritans mm. because of this history? It, it, it's, it's, it's much, it's too much to speak about it, but we have to understand very it's clearly what real. happens. Yeah, what happens was that Jeroboam, for instance, he tried to establish, right with breaking with uh, Roboam, for instance, he tried to establish another kingdom, another type of, re, another religion. So right in that uh, mixture, right in that environment, uh, they put something else. So they had a counterfeit. You see, it was the counterfeit religion of Samaritan, which they were mi mixed together, paganism with Judaism. And that was the most dangerous for Israelites. And God said also very clear, you should not mingle with nations. You should not mingle with others because God knew that this mingling, this mixture together uh, will create more problems. In other words, the sin all the time gains victory. So when we have a joint, for instance, in marriage, for instance, with a, uh, how do you call it? Un, un, uh, fit, what, un, how do you call it? Un, un, unbeliever? Yeah. When we go to, to marry with somebody else, for instance, uh, we, is, when, I, when I say that we are not going to you know, be happy, but you'll have a lot of challenges. So what happens with them, they say, God said, do not marry with other nations. But they all, all, all of a sudden, they, they broke all of that. And we see the, the, the consequences. God has led them in their will and they be taken by Israel. So there are consequences after the consequences, but we do have to understand that if we do not truly believe in Jesus 100%, not 99, 100%, mingling or mixture, putting together things, uh, paganism and Christianity, for instance, doesn't work with God like this. So God will let us uh, uh, after all in our patience and our thoughts. Uh, so this is what happened practically in Israel. So is it safe to say that the Jews stayed away from the Samaritans. They Correct. weren't, they were not mingling with them. They were staying, they did not want any part of them. Correct. Which was why G making the fact that Jesus wanted to go through Samaria and then have this conversation with the Samaritan woman, that was a big deal Correct. during that time. 
Yes. Um, so, so what can we learn from this encounter about witnessing to those who are different from us, whether it's cultural, economic status, religious background, sexual pre preference, race? Mm -hmm. How can we learn from Jesus in this situation and a lesson in acceptance to say that because Jesus saw this woman and still witnessed to her and still ministered to her, even though she had five husbands and was with a six man that wasn't her husband, he still offered her the living water of his sacrifice. What can we learn from Jesus on that regard? Um, can I say one thought that, that just comes to me right now is the fact that Jesus going there was no accident. So I think that the mere fact that Jesus went to meet up with the woman who was considered a dog in the Jews' eyes, we need to see how, uh, we need to apply that in our own lives so that when we are with people or when we see a group of people or are sent to a group of people, that we should be able to just open our arms and just love them completely, just like Jesus did with this woman. He didn't show any partiality, uh, nothing against this woman at all. I'm going to take the perspective of the disciples um, because Jesus led them to Samaria. They had no idea why they were going through there. Um, they didn't know why we were confronting this woman, you know, because she was the outcast of the outcast. Um, and they had no idea what he was talking about, about food. But God was patient with them. Jesus was patient with them. He showed them and he let them still. So I think um, for me, when I'm in a situation or when I'm confronted with my prejudices, my preconceptions, mm. I, um, I ask God, what, what do you want me to say? Where do you want me to go? Because the Holy Spirit is going to lead me in a situation that I may not fully understand why I'm there and what to say. But if yeah. I ask him, he will give me, he will give me that water to give to that person. Mm. But I have to remember to ask him and not let my prejudice run away with me. <laughs> we have to understand also, uh, very, very beautiful Heather, um, but we have to understand very clear that Jesus came to save those who were lost. Mm -hmm. uh, not, th no, not, not, those, not, not those who believe that they are saved. Uh, Jesus did not come for the saved people, for those, for the elite, as they consider they are well. Jesus came to save that those who are lost. In other words, Jesus came for us, for everybody. There is no race. There is no color of skin. There is no gender. There is nothing for Jesus Christ. He, he, he went to talk to the lady, that, as, as Heather was saying, the outcast of the outcasts. Mm. Uh, in that because she was lost and she was a treasure for Jesus Christ. How much more we should value every single human being because he's our brother. No matter what clothes he has or she has, what color of skin, what, uh, whatever uh, uh, social, it's interesting the social distancing right now is creating it. Social yeah. distancing means uh, you are poor, I am rich. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, social distance means uh, socially we have to stay separated. For me, it's physical distance, not social distance. Social distance means something else for me personally. But there is, there is the contrast right now because people are trying to social distancing us. Uh, you are white, I am black. Uh, this, is, this is social distance for me personally. I'm okay. saying, yeah. but, I think they recommend it calling physical distancing now. I've read an article. It's better. It's, better. it's better. So, Pastor, you're, 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 you're right. You're yeah. right. So it's, it's physical a message, distancing. The message in our society that we have to be separated uh, because of the, the financial or whatever, whatever. And mm -hmm. this is coming also in our church. When some people coming, for instance, are not well dressed, as James addressed that, how do you interact? Are you welcome mm. at home? Are you accepting in your group? We have so many groups in the church. I've been to a church in Spain. We were like 10 nations, practically, but there were 13 groups. You know, like, <laughs> are more groups than nations? Like, there was so much division. Why? Because we do not take into consideration what you have asked, Sister uh, Crystal, 
how Jesus interacted with those people and how value those individuals. We should value every single human being. Yeah. Yeah. See, which is of course of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I really, I really like how how Jesus started the conversation with her. You know, it was just a simple question. You know, and that one simple question, you know, led to her accepting Jesus as as her savior. But more than that, in a very short amount of time, she realized who she was and decided to share that that uh, that knowledge that joy with the whole town and you know and then everybody the entire town if i'm not mistaken comes back mm -hmm. and hears what jesus says so i mean when i when i look at this i i see you know a person that does that's that according to society is not worth that much but if if jesus because jesus took the time just a little bit of time to to get to know her and to speak with her that's the fruit of her work is amazing, you know, and we can all learn just a little bit from, you know, what she did, so. Yeah, you see, it, like Jesus, um, you know, it's interesting because as he, as he was revealing, uh, you know, he made the offer and then he let her know that I know who you are, okay, mm -hmm. and so, <laughs> so with us, you know, I, I think we should, we should show love first and then as we get to know people, we continue to show love because it's it's more impressive then because then it's like well like, yeah you may be dealing with x y and z but that's not a prerequisite for me to show love and acceptance and also too you see that jesus was uh not willing to get too much into a debate about things and uh you know but he at the same time he didn't say well it doesn't matter what you believe he did stand up and say this is what we believe but he didn't want to get pulled into the debate of being distracted from her own personal salvation because that's really what it comes down to for whenever you're interacting with somebody. It's you can go back and forth about particulars and all these other things, but it's like, do you, but do, but I, but Jesus wants to to save that person, and I think we should have that that kind of focus on the salvation of the other person. And from the from the point of evangelism, strategy how to evangelize, especially in the United States, is go to your neighbor and ask him to give you something. Uh, this is how I interact with my neighbors. Okay. The culture, United States culture is that um, you cannot help somebody, okay? If you want to help somebody, your neighbors, they feel offended. Mm. They say, oh, do I like something? They believe that they have everything, okay? So, but if you, for instance, ask them, give me something, I want to drink some water, give me some salt. One day I sent my wife to the neighbors and she didn't have salt. I said, can you go and talk to the neighbors? Maybe she has something. And we established relationship very fast. Then he came and asked me something, detergent for the, the, I don't know, something. So we began to interact and we began to have a good mm. relationship. So when you ask somebody to give you something, you are in the need. You lower yourself and you value yes. the other. And this is an opportunity to interact and talk to individuals. Don't offer him something first, but ask mm. him to help you first. And then Jesus mm. said, Jesus gave her something that she needed. But after he said, I need something from you. You see, interesting. This is that is working incredibly. That's a good point. Mm. So it's interesting that you brought up the neighbor's pastor because we also, Jesus went out of his way. He went to Samaria to mm. minister to this woman. But we want to begin where we are, which is Tuesday's lesson. So let's read John. Um, we have two different sets of texts. John chapter 1, verses 40 through 41. And then John chapter 12, verses 20 through 26. The first one is John chapter 1, verses 40 through 41. And whoever grabs that can read it. Uh, it says, one of the two heard John speak and follow him as Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah. Okay, and then John chapter 12, verses 20 through 26. Now, there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethesda, uh, Bethaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip kept and told, told Andrew, 
and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be. If anyone serves me, him, my father will honor. Okay, so we can see in these two texts, we have Andrew who came and followed Jesus and immediately he went and witnessed to, that was his brother, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they, um, so then we have, I'm sorry, I, I lost my place. Philip came to Andrew and then Andrew immediately said, okay, here's Jesus. And then they, they talked there. So Andrew was right there. When people came to him, he was like, all right, I'm going to tell you. What can we learn from Andrew about witnessing to people who are close to us? Um, you know, right now in our the time of physical distancing, thank you, Pastor and Samuel, for that term. Um, it's hard to, that, to be around people because we're just not. But how can we witness to someone that's close to us, whether it is a coworker if we're back at work, or we might be on virtual like this, um, a family member that we really would like to witness to. Where do we start with that? Mm -hmm. And how do we overcome our own fear of seeming weird by, you know, of weird by sharing Christ with someone that is that close to us? That's a beautiful question. I think like Jesus, you need to be praying and asking for the Holy Spirit. And like Andrew, when you see opportunities, you have to have to take it uh, to share in, in, in uh, whatever way that the Lord reveals to you. Uh, whether people ask you about why you have so much peace or why you do certain things or uh, what have you, I think it's important. Uh, and, and then I think it's good to be like authentic and share that Christ is a part of your life, your, your walk is a part of your life. And... Um, you know, don't, don't hide it. And then also, you know, share it because questions do come up. Coworkers do ask questions sometimes of me. And so, you know, you just share, share what you believe. Another best strategy that Philip is using here, that we had discussed it and studied in, in uh, evangelist is that Philip went to talk to uh, Nathaniel, for instance, and he told him, um, Nathaniel was praying. You remember the picture that we were we were just talking about it. And Philip and uh, Nathaniel says, "Is something good? Some, can something good come from Nazareth?" And what Philip said, "Come and see." Come and see. Yeah. Mm. The main problem we have in in our church is that we are trying to convince people uh, what we believe. Mm. When we try to convince people about the truth, we are making the biggest mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever, if you speak with the, the most humble individual or the a Baptist pastor or Pentecostal, whatever individual, yeah, yeah. in the moment you are telling him, let me tell you what is the truth, guess what? Nobody will, will accept because this is your point that you believe that you are superior to the other individual and teach him. I've been to the Amazon rivers I was sharing with you. Not even the, those individuals accept something to be taught to learn from you. In the moment you are coming, like a gringo, to teach them, they put a shield. They do not accept it. So what we do, what I learn is, let me share with you, okay? Come and see. Can something good come from Nazareth? Come. Okay? Let you have to see. Okay? So when we direct individuals toward the Bible, not toward me, what we believe, what I, I believe, but what the Bible say, says, it's very important. So in other words, every time you have to say, if somebody is coming and talking to you, hey, I have this, 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 what do you think? You have to tell him, hey, that's interesting what you say, and you remove yourself from the picture and share Jesus. But would you like to know what the Bible says? You see what I'm sharing with you. So every single time when you have a conflict or you have to share Jesus Christ, use the tactic, the strategy of a feeling. Come and see experience yourself see yourself there is a point in the story that we can share our testimony but the first impact is come and see 
And so not everyone that we encounter will be easy. Correct. Um, we know that in some people will be easier to witness to than, than others. And Jesus kind of dealt with that same thing. And so our Wednesday's lesson is also talking about dealing with difficult people because we know that that happens as we want to tell people to come and see and we want to share with those around us or even just those who we get the opportunity, like Samuel said. Um, so let's see how Jesus also dealt with difficult people. So if we can read uh, Matthew chapter 4, 18 through 19, and then Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. The first one is Matthew chapter 4, 18 through 19. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. We're going to talk about that in a second. And then Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. Okay. I, if it's all right, I'll read it for you. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him and saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him saying do you not even fear god seeing you are under the same condemnation and we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds but this man has done nothing wrong then he said to jesus lord remember me when you come into your kingdom and jesus said to him assuredly i say to you today you will be with me in paradise okay so in these two chapter in these two texts the first one with there being the fishers of men we know fishermen are not necessarily the um easiest people to deal with or the nicest people they may not have the nicest language their behavior may not be the nicest so i'm sure when jesus told the fishermen come and follow me cast down your nights well, i'll make you fishers of men i'm sure it wasn't an easy road to go down they were just like oh yes we're gonna follow you and then just walked away happily and saying who about y'all um <laughs> also you have the thief on the cross who is challenging jesus right there while they're both dying so G throughout the new testament jesus was insulted he was yelled at he was challenged mm -hmm. um if someone approached you in this way how likely would you be to witness to them mm -hmm. mm. Well, I mean, I think the, the best approach is based on your, on your actions. You know, your action speaks louder than your words. So in situations like that, I think we have to be careful because uh, not only that you know, we can, we can look, cause to lose our soul, but also they can, they can, I mean, if we start acting, you know, aggressive or if we get upset, you know, they, they see that you're different, but yet you're acting like, you know, like everybody else. So, you know, we, we have to be, we have to be very careful and we have to realize that even though we may not know, you know, the people around us, coworkers, friends, you know, family members, you know, they're, they're watching us. And, you know, as long as we, we reflect the, the character of Jesus in us, then we might have a chance of being able to witness to that person. Otherwise, you know, they're like, well, he's just like everybody else. You know? So why don't you listen to what he has to say? Yeah. And what, cha what changes can we make in order to see these people through the eyes of Jesus? Just like Jesus, when Jesus saw um, the thief on the cross, when, he, when the young rich ruler came and challenged him with questions that they thought he couldn't answer when the pharisees came and, and challenged jesus he didn't see them as we would as humans he saw them through different eyes how can we make changes to see people who are challenging us and our faith through those same eyes uh, that's a very interesting question and i don't want to hog the the board here but um in, in step to christ i don't remember it's, it's at the beginning and one of the beginning chapters it, it says that you know um we have to we have to remember that all the people on on this planet they're god's children mm -hmm. and you know we have to we have to respect that 
we have to show them kindness because if we if we don't show them kindness it reflects back to back to jesus because we don't show jesus kindness through his with his children mm. you know so i mean a, a long time ago i i realized that you know i might think bad about a person where he might not be you know the best dressed person in the world but I am in the same boat as he is. The only difference is that I know I may know a little more about Jesus than he does. But we're we're on the same plane. We're on the same. He's just a, a sinner, just like I am. Mm-hmm. And you know, Jesus died for me, and he also died for him. Mm-hmm. And he loved that person just as much as he loved me. So what what right do I have to treat him? more or or differently than how jesus would treat that person or how jesus would treat me for for that man mm-hmm. i think and, and i want to thank you so much Mikhai, um, because you write about it and the other point that i want to make is that every single individual that looks very difficult has a background it's difficult because and we do not know the reasons why it's it's in, in that situation okay because we are also difficult there is no individual who is not difficult my wife can tell that i'm difficult so so it's so the category of being difficult so that the category that's of true the being difficult means you you look on the mirror and you are difficult also for yourself uh, but here all men are difficult well everybody is difficult so where is the that's true. when we when we go and when we uh, talk to somebody that looks different than i yeah. uh, and looks difficult from my perspective we have to understand that there is a background that he is coming from. He suffered some experiences that I have never experienced. I did not pass. Uh, I am, as a pastor, I, there are many people angry with me. Uh, many, some of them. There are some people, and, and all the time, I'm not the one to take them as, you know, what they say or what they do against me, but to understand why do they behave like this? What's going on? And as, as Mikhail said, if we place ourselves in the same level with them, we understand that we have to love them as God loved us. So loving is a principle, and, and we have to understand that everybody is affected by its own environment. So let us not judge individuals according to the environment or the background they are in, but who they are, which are God's children, and share what we know and how we are sharing a little bit, little bit with them. There are more to, t- to say about the strategy, how to approach, but maybe some other study we will have about strategies, how to engage with uh, yourself as a difficult and to others individuals more difficult than you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I also try to remember that people we meet, we're either going to be stepping stones towards Jesus or stumbling blocks. Mm. And sometimes it's better um, for me to be quiet and because Jesus didn't answer every accusation. Mm. And sometimes you try to live the Jesus in your life. But that has always been um, something I thought of with my behavior. Am I being a stepping stone or am I being a stumbling block? So those are the things I try to consider when I meet what I consider difficult people. Thank you for that. And so then we move on to Thursday's lesson where we are sensing providential opportunities. Um, And we read for that Acts uh, chapter 8, verses 26 through 37. This is the story of Philip and the eunuch. I want to grab that. That's Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 37. And before going to that, uh, I just want to have another point to the previous topic uh, regarding the difficult individuals. There is a life to show. It's It's a character. It's a way of behaving with these type of individuals that we need to be patient with them. And somebody of said, somebody, some of you said, but at the same time, we have to have to develop a relationship with those type of people. When we develop a relationship with people, then we can do Jesus Christ. They have to see who we are and, uh, and Jesus will work in their life. Jesus Christ took the most difficult individuals in the world 
and he lived with them. He shared the gospel with them. And this is how it, they have seen their actions and they, in the light of Jesus, they change according to the, the Bible. And also the Holy Spirit was the most important in that action. Mm -hmm. All right. Does someone have Acts um, 26 through 37? Which Acts what? Uh, verse, chapter 8, verses 26 through 37. I'm sorry, I didn't say the chapter. <laughs> I'm going to Acts 26. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. 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 I'd be happy to read that for you. Thank you. Okay. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Wait, Barnabas wait. took him. No, chap Acts chapter 8. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm on chapter uh, 9. I, I apologize. What, and we're doing from 26. I, I'm sorry. I thought that was interesting, though, wasn't it? Yes. yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> now, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. Continue? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. The place in the scripture which he read was this. This is Isaiah 53. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say of this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here's some water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So mm. he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Mm. Now, when he came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Mm. So have you ever had an experience where you knew it was the Holy Spirit sending you to a person or a place to do something for someone? And how did you feel after that experience? Mm. Yes. <laughs> I, I did. And if you don't mind that I answer, when I was doing um, literature evangelism in Michigan, um, and it was quite an experience going door to door and meeting people and um, talking to them. And a lot of times it was cold calling. And I, I got to tell you, it was very interesting. And I met one day a lady whose husband was waiting for a lung transplant. Mm -hmm. And I knocked on her door and uh, she came to the door and I was talking to her and I showed her the books that I was selling and they were the uh, Bible story books. And she said, oh, she said, I, I have those. I have one of those. So she invited me to come into her house and I went in and she had one book that someone had given to her and, and she shared with me what a treasure this book was. I mean, I felt like God had just brought me to that house. I shared with this lady, with her husband. I prayed with them. And I ended up becoming somewhat friends with them. Mm -hmm. She was trying to earn money 
um, to help with their bills because her husband wasn't able to work. And so um, I had some materials and she was making quilts. And so I was able to bring all these materials to her that I really didn't know what I was going to do with anyway. It just mm. amazed me that the Lord put me in touch with, with this particular lady. And I was able to give her something I had that she needed. And it, it was just out of the clear blue to me. Mm. <laughs> it was wonderful. Beautiful, beautiful experience. Yes. Wonderful. Test. Anyone else would like to share an experience like that? I I can I can share um, one uh, or more, but uh, I remember I was in Jordan with my wife, and uh, I was in one of the neighborhood, one of the most dangerous neighborhood in Lima. Okay, I was in Peru, Lima, and I was living at that time uh, to a, a friend uh, house, and no taxi will stop to take me to. To, to, to take me to airport. And it was a very dangerous situation for us to go on the street. So finally I decided to go on the street after calling many, many friends on the, on the phone to come and pick us, to take us to the airport because we were going back to Spain in that time. And all of a sudden when I went outside, um, I, I just made the hand and, and a taxi just stopped a few, a few uh, feet far. And he came back and he said, yes, where are you going? And I said, I want to go faster to the airport because I have a plane in two hours. He said, okay, how much do you charge me? I asked him. And he charged me very, very little. Uh, and I was like, oh, something is all going wrong because people in that or the taxis, they are taking you. This is famous in Lima. They take, mm -hmm. you, they take you another place and they kill you and takes everybody that you have. And Ooh. it's a very dangerous place in Lima. Uh, not all the places are safe in the world. So I was very concerned, am I going with this man or not? And I was very stressed about it. And my wife, we had the luggages or the baggage. And in the, in the, in the way, we, I began to share Jesus with him. And he said something incredible. He said, you know, I just fought with my son. We were physically fighting. And that was my, my hour. My shift has been finished for a long time. I was heading home. But a voice came. Oh. And I said, Stop the car now. And then he stopped and he came back and he took me and he was crying. Oh. And the, like the driver, I think was like half an hour or 45 minutes. And he said, God sent you here for me. Where mm. what is the church that you are going? You saved my life, he said. Oh. And um, I, we, we just shared uh, about the information. I don't know what happened. So we have this type of miracles every single day. When mm. we are able to open our ears and see Jesus Christ and be able to serve Jesus. So my mm -hmm. challenge for those people who are watching right now is to ask this question, brothers and sisters. Lord, mm -hmm. what do you want me to do to do, to do today for you? And mm -hmm. God will open opportunities, incredible opportunities uh, to give you. So let us, let's have this challenge in our life service mm -hmm. today. Amen. Amen. And I thank you for that challenge, Pastor. And so we're going to wrap up with this final question. Um, in looking at major conversions, like in the Bible, like Saul of Tarsus that Mary Lou was reading about a moment ago. <laughs> Holy Spirit had you read that, that first Mary Lou. Um, exactly. <laughs> He was a cheater. He was a liar. Mm -hmm. What is the danger in judging a book by its cover? And how can we have, what can we do to have more patience and love when we witness to people before their conversion? Mm. You never know if you're going to be that instrument that God's using to lead them to that conversion. Amen. Yes, that's a beautiful question. Well, I think it goes back to what Pastor said about asking the Lord, you know, what do you want me to, what, you know, I'm going to remember that. What do you want me to do today yeah. uh, for you today? And, and, and establishing that relationship with the Lord, because I think, you know, we get impatient because we forget that it's, it's, we forget that it's Jesus's work. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the salvation of men is the work of God. We are to participate in it because God knows that for our own salvation, that is what we are supposed to do. But ultimately, this is God's work. But when we think that it's our work, then we want things to happen on our time. And that's the problem <laughs> in our way versus God's way and God's time. And I think we have to start to see it that way, that we are serving the Lord. 
Amen. We, we, we are ultimately this person that we come as just, just like our children, you know, ultimately they're responsible to God. So therefore we want to make sure that anything we do is to encourage them to come to the Lord and not, and not try to rush them, rush them in, into growing up. Amen. And the other, the other point that I want to make is that, uh, thank you so much, Samuel. The other point is very, very important for me personally, for all of us is that God does not need holy people to go mm. to the streets. God sanctifies and makes us holy. What I'm trying to say is that don't wait to be to have patience first or to mm. be a good man or to have incredible behavior to shame Jesus in your because never happened that. That's so right. it's it's the, the way it's just go God as Samuel said we have to we have to remember very clear that this is his gospel, not our gospel. We are not going in our power. We are not going because we are holy, but because we are sinners. The mm. problem is when we are going and we have no patience. Who is the one to say? I, I am the, the faultless in the impatience than anybody. I am very active, very, and I make mistakes, a lot of mistakes, but that doesn't stop me to share the gospel. So the mm. first step is where you are, what you are, share what you know, and just start. You don't have to wait to be holy. Okay, don't wait to be patient. Don't wait to be uh, loving individuals. Don't, don't, don't wait on those factors, but God just go. It's like a process of Jordan River. Jesus said, you go. Matthew chapter 28, just go. And don't wait, don't wait to tell you again, just go. And Jesus will be in charge of your life. And by beholding, you will be changed. In other words, do not wait to be that individual. And, and the Bible says very clearly in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 27, says very clearly, God has called those who are not prepared, those who have no patience, those who have no gifts. God has called all of those people, says here, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 27. Uh, to put the shame to wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world, to put the shame, the things which are mine, and, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised. God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glorify in his presence. In other words, don't wait miracles to happen before you go. Miracles will wait for you on the way when you go. Amen. Amen. I love that scripture. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in the Sabbath school of seeing people through the eyes of Jesus. I think we've learned a lot about how Jesus looks at people and what we can do to share in how Jesus looks at that because he is our ultimate role model in today's terms. Amen. He is who we are mirroring to be like in our everyday lives. So thank you for each one of you for um joining in the discussion and thank you all for joining us for Sabbath school this morning. And before we have our closing prayer, I'd like to join you to, I'd like to invite you, sorry, to join us next week as we study prayer power, interceding for others. So then, so now that we understand how to see people mm. through Jesus' eyes, we will now go before the throne for others in their time of need. I'll just ask Sister Mary Lou to close us out in prayer for our Sabbath school. All right. Heavenly Father, um, what a privilege it is to open your word and to share the things that we are learning and sometimes the things that we don't understand and we can talk to each other and, and try to get a better insight. It's been a real blessing for us to spend this time together and we pray that those that are watching, that they will have a blessing as well. And Lord, please, open our eyes to the things that we can do for you today. Help us to see people through your eyes. Help us to love everyone with the kind of love that you showed this world, the kind of love that you expressed to, to each one of us in saving us from our sins, Lord, from the consequences of this, this life that um, we are so guilty of living. And I just ask now that you would bless each person, give everyone a special happy Sabbath day, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.